Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. If we haven't met yet, my name is Sophia and I'm a worship leader here. Um, if you're able to, let's all stand together and worship. one. He has one. That's exciting. Hey, good morning. It is good to see you, whether you are in this room or you're watching online this morning. It is so good to have you a part of what God is doing here at Foothills this morning. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here and just excited to be able to welcome you uh, to our time of worship. And today, of course, is Mother's Day. Oh, we want to exp yeah, give it up for all the moms. Absolutely. You deserve it. Whether you are a new mom, a be a mom for a long time, you're a grandma, you're a single mom, you're an adoptive mom, you're raising kids that perhaps aren't even your own, and so many other categories of moms, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. You are so valued, so appreciated, and so loved. And so thank you. Let me also say I understand that Mother's Day can also be a real difficult time. It can be a challenging time. Perhaps you, you long to be a mom and you're not a mom yet. Maybe you had a bad experience with a mom. Maybe 
maybe even you made some mistakes as a mom and it's just a struggle. I want you to know that you are seen, that you are loved, that you are cared about, and we appreciate and value you as well. So happy Mother's Day to you all. It is a good day and there is a lot worth celebrating. Hey, let me share just a few things that God is doing around uh, Foothills and how you can get involved. He is doing incredible things. And first thing I want to talk about is celebrate recovery. Oh, yeah, come on. All of us, all of us deal with hurts, habits, and hangups. That's the reality of life. And oftentimes because of that, what do we do? We isolate, we pull away, and celebrate recovery is the opposite of that. It is the opposite of isolation, and I love that. And we want to invite you to join our CR group. They meet on Friday evenings, and they say it's what? Like the best place to be on a Friday? There you go. Yeah, come on. <laughs> it's awesome people. Join them on, at what time do you guys meet? It's, uh, 7 p.m., 7 p.m. on Friday nights in the multi-purpose room. Uh, join them. Jesse Coates would love to answer any questions you have if you would like more information. Hey, last week, Kurt, Pastor Kurt shared uh, how FSM, Foothill Students Min Ministries, is joining again with the Country Church for an event called Limitless. Limitless is an event for students middle school through college, and they are planning for literally hundreds of students to show up and just have an amazing time together. They've got so many things planned, basketball ball tournament, volleyball, gaga ball, foosball, any kind of ball, all kinds of ball games apparently, video games, amazing stuff, all for the purpose of introducing students to Jesus. So we'll be praying for that. It's all happening on, uh, where's my notes? I don't even have it. It's up there, right? What day is it? There it is. It's happening on the 21st. Uh, pray for them. It's going to be an amazing event. And uh, we are praying that a lot of students get introduced to and accept a relationship with Jesus on that night. So you can still sign up if you're a student. Just go to LimitlessOneNight.com and you can register. There's no charge. It's going to be a great night. Hey, next Saturday, actually this coming Saturday, a week from yesterday, men, this is for you. I want to invite you to join us up at our Beaver Creek campus for a work day. We are going to meet up there at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. We're going to work till about 12 o'clock. God has got amazing plans for that property beginning this summer. We are, in fact, going to be hosting a kids camp, Camp Courage, in August. Yeah, that's worth applauding. Absolutely. In fact, they have a table back in the lobby this morning if you'd like more information on Camp Courage, but there's a lot of work to be done, so, they, so we're ready for that, um, along with just a whole host of other things. So, man, we'd love to invite you to come and join us. Uh, if you have things like a pulse law or a saw or loppers or a chainsaw, if you have a quad with a trailer, uh, we can use it all, and we can use your presence as well. We're going to be clearing trails. We're going to be blazing trails through the woods, a lot of fun. So we're going to work from 8 to 12, and at 12 o'clock, we're going to stop for a killer barbecue. Man, we are going to eat so well. Trust me on this. It's going to be great. We normally do a men's breakfast uh, each month, as you may be aware. We're not doing it this month because of this work day. We're not going to do a, a breakfast next month as well because we're going to do a repeat. We're going to do another work day and barbecue in June. So we'd love to have you join us up at our Beaver Creek campus at 8 o'clock this Saturday. And then also at our Beaver Creek campus on Memorial Day weekend, I want to invite you to join us for a good old-fashioned church potluck. It it's going to be so much fun. If you want to come and enjoy an amazing meal, meet some great people, join us on that Sunday night at, at 6 o'clock on May 29th. Uh, if you are coming, we'd love to know uh, because we're counting on you for the food. So if you can go online and just let us know you're coming and what you're bringing, that would be really helpful. But it's going to be a great, great night together. And then lastly, you know, I, I love what I see here at Foothills. I love to see all so many new people coming, new families, new people. Uh, just We're growing like crazy, and I love that. God is doing amazing work here. And one of, one of uh, the things that we just love to do is greet people as they come in the door. We love to greet people with a big smile, put a smile on their face, and we are always looking for more people. We call the, those people our host. We're looking for more people to host, especially in this service. If you enjoy being hospitable, if you enjoy putting a smile on people's faces, stop by our welcome desk right back in the lobby. They'll give you more information on how you can get involved in, in this ministry of, of hospitality and being a host. Well, let me pray as we continue in our time of worship together. Father God, we are so grateful to be here today. Lord, it is truly a gift 
and a privilege to gather together like this and to worship you, to listen to you. And God, we want to give you full permission to speak into our lives this morning. And God, this morning, we especially just want to say thank you for the moms in our life. Lord, the moms in this world, this world's a better place because of moms. And we are so grateful for you. are so thankful. And God, I pray for those that, that struggle today be, with it being Mother's Day. God, would you draw near? Would you be a, just a, 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 your presence would just fill them with peace and with hope. Lord, we are so grateful to be able to celebrate moms and the moms in our lives today. And Lord, right now, we just worship you for who you are, for what you're doing. We are so grateful to you. And so we give you our time of worship in this moment. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Would you stand with me as we continue in our time of worship?
That's funny right there. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, yes, this is Pastor Dale. In case you're confused, for those of you that have, uh, you're new and you don't realize that we have a Mother's Day, I, our family, we have a Mother's Day tradition that my wife gets to dress me once a year on Sunday morning. So, this is the Mother's Day uniform, all right? And a small price to pay to make a few ladies in my life happy, you know? My wife loves it, my Mom, of course, loves it. I think my daughters even like it too. So there you go. Uh, so welcome. Happy Mother's Day to you all. Happy Mother's Day to those watching on the live stream. You don't have to change the, you know, the station, okay? It is me, all right? So um, we just like to have fun with that. Glad you're here. Hey, I want to start off just by uh, an announcement here. I know Brian did a great job. I, I want to highlight this Camp Courage that we have going on in August. Folks, listen, we're so excited about being able to do camps for kids, and we need volunteers. We need an army of volunteers. So I don't know how you can help. Maybe you can't help all week. Maybe you can help during, you know, for a few days. There's a table out there. Please help us reach kids in our communities for Jesus. And uh, again, we're excited about that upcoming opportunity this summer. So today we're going to continue our series on this family life tune-up, and today is about how to be the parent that your child needs. And let me just say that as we talk about this, uh, it, it obviously applies to those of you that are parents, and those of you that are looking forward to being parents, but also grandparents, um, even those of you that just influence children. So these principles apply across the board. I, I don't know about you, but uh, again, out of all of life's challenges that can make us feel inadequate in, about ourselves, and there's plenty of them. Sometimes school does that. Job can do that. Marriage does that. Finances can do that. I know over the years serving in a church, I mean, I have felt woefully inadequate for the task of being a pastor plenty of times. But parenting, that's got to be at the top of the list. Parenting can be the most exasperating, confusing perplexing experience, and yet, at the same time, one of the most rewarding. I actually thought that uh, I was pretty mature for my age when we have had our first child at a whole 25 years old. I'm telling you, for me personally, though, the challenges of marriage were nothing like the challenges of being a parent. No matter how prepared I thought I was, nothing adequately prepared me for that experience. I mean, at least when you go out and you buy a new truck or a new car, it comes with an owner's manual, Go drive. I remember that first experience driving home from the hospital, baby, car seat, and then just terrifying expectation that I don't have a clue of what I'm supposed to do. And yet, becoming a parent, becoming a parent that our kids need is a challenge we all have to embrace. In fact, God's word calls us in to that challenge. And we're going to talk about what that means today and what that looks like. And I'm going to start off by, by using a verse some of you might be very familiar with, some of you this will be the first time you've heard it. And I use it in two different translations. I like them both, okay? So I, I just, it's the same verse, different translations. I like the wording of both. Proverbs 22, 6. Teach your children right from wrong. Yes, that's what we have to do. And when they're grown, they will still do right. We all, we all want that for our kids as parents. The, the next, the English uh, standard version says it like this. Train up a child in the way that they should go. And we're, we're going to really key in on this word train today. Train up a child in the way that they should go. And so even when they're old, they will not depart from that, 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 that training we gave to them. These scriptures give us a promise that we all want to experience. We all desire for our kids to do right as adults. This requires us to embrace our role as parents to intentionally train our kids. Today, I want to share what that practically looks like. I love the definition of the word train. The definition of train is simply this. Look, the skill, the knowledge, or an experience, three things, acquired by the one that trains. This is, I believe, our job as parents. Our kids need parents who embrace their God-ordained role to impart skills, to impart knowledge, and here's the key too, impart experience necessary to be successful in this broken world. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. We're training kids to be adults who can live in this broken world. 
And it's brutal out there. It's difficult out there. So, so we had to be crazy intentional as parents in this training process. So this morning, what I want to do is I, want, I, I just, it's going to be just very practical. We take the word train, made an acronym about it, with it. And then each one of those letters is going to represent really uh, an area that your kids need this from you. Your kids need this from you. This is the kind of parent you need to be. And so let's jump in. Here you go. Here's the acronym TRAIN. T, stay with, what does it stand for? T stands for TEACH. Kind of obvious. We have to teach. Deuteronomy 6 is my all-time favorite parenting passage. I love this passage. If you forget everything else today, please do not forget this passage. Go home and read it, process it, talk about what it means, because I love this passage. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. It's going to explain to us what teaching looks like. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. This is Moses talking to the nation of Israel. He says, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up and you tie them on your hands and you wear them on your forehead as reminders. You write them on your doorposts and on your house and on your gates. He's he's explained to them how you impart what's in you to the next generation. How do we teach them? And oh, I love this. So, so there's four things in this passage I'm going to go through very, very quickly. None of what I'm talking about today, I don't have time to do any of this justice. So we're going to go pretty fast. So here you go. What does teaching look like? Teaching happens, first of all, when you are wholeheartedly committed. It starts with you. That's what Moses says. You must, com- you must commit yourselves, parents, wholeheartedly. Everything we do as parents arises and falls with this principle. Are the truths and the values we're seeking to impart into our kids wholeheartedly in us? Are we sold out to everything that we're trying to teach our children? Folks, I, I got to tell you this. Hypocrisy, hypocrisy kills the transfer of values into the lives of our kids. It just, it just kills it. We cannot impart to others what we do not have. We cannot think we can lead others where, where we will not go, where we're, we're not going. Parenting is no different. Everything you want your kids to be needs to be wholeheartedly in you first. Not, not perfect. We are nothing about today is, is talking about being perfect. But we influence through example. They watch us. More is caught than taught. They're catching all of this from you. Is honesty in you? Is integrity in you? Is compassion, generosity, courage, humility, obedience to the word of God? Is it in you? When you walk out of the store and you're walking through the parking lot back to your car, and many of you look at your receipts while you're doing that, right? And your kids are with you and you go, oh, check that out. They didn't charge us for that thing. Cool. What did you just teach? Right? You just taught them how to be dishonest. Or do you go, "Uh uh-oh, they didn't charge us for this. Come on, we got to go back in. Why? Because we have to do what's right. We have, to go, we have to go take care of this because that's what God would want us to do. Do they see that in you? You're driving, you know, the kids are in your car, or the guy cuts you off on the freeway, and we have our little moment of road rage in front of our kids. What did we just teach them about how to handle that when they're driving eventually? How do they see us encounter needy people? How do they see us, even in our marriages, Resolve marital conflict. Well, we never fight in front of our kids. Well, I don't think that you should fight in front of your kids, but, but your kids already know your marriage isn't perfect. And if they never see you resolve things, how are they going to know how to resolve things when they're married? Your kids will not remember everything you say. They will remember the example that you set. Is it wholeheartedly in you? We, first and foremost, we teach that way. Here's the next thing the passage says. Teaching happens through repetition. Repetition. Repeat them again and again to your children. Oh, I love this principle. So if you've been coming to Foothills for any length of time, you've probably already noticed that I repeat things over and over again. I do. And if if you haven't noticed that, you will. One of the things I've been saying for decades, all right? He's going to say it again. Some of you already know what I'm going to say. Obedience. All right, some of you, this is new to you. Awesome. Time for me to get this into your head. I have been saying this for decades. Hear it? Let's say it again. Obedience equals blessing. One more time. Obedience equals blessing. I, don't, I, I, need, I need you to say this with a little more oomph. Some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. Come on. 
Obedience equals blessing. Why would I do this? Because I wanted to be in you. I, I want you to remember it. I want you to know that, that it's not just a phrase. It's not just, this is how life works. That when we obey God's word, there's blessing on the back side of that. And, and this is a biblical principle. This is a life principle. I, as your pastor, want you to live this way. And there's going to come moments that, that you're going to be faced with a decision. And then all of a sudden, the, that voice, is, you're going you're to hear it in your head. <laughs> awesome. Okay? And you're going to go, wait. Man, I've heard that. Obedience equals blessing. And then you're going to choose obedience. You're going to choose the right path. Folks, I'm telling you, it works that way with parenting. Even to this day, there are times my daughters will say, Dad, this came up. I had this choice. And I couldn't get your voice out of my head. All right? <laughs> and, I'm, and, I, and I laugh and I go, the plan worked perfectly. Okay? <laughs> That's what we want as parents. Listen, effective teaching happens when we repeat things over and over and over again. I, I want to create right neurological pathways. That's what repetition does. That's what, why repetition is important. You create these neurological pathways so that when you're faced with these, these, these opportunities, that's what you hear. How are we doing that? How are we doing that with our kids? What right things are you saying to them over and over again? Right values, right truths. Are, are you repeating this over and over and over again to your kids? Teaching happens through repetition. Well, I've told them once, it's not enough. It's not enough. Teaching also happens, look at through lifestyle discussions. Lifestyle discussions. It says, talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when, when you're going go to bed, when you get up. See, all the time. It's lifestyle. Do you talk about values? Do you talk about character? Do you talk about experiencing God? Making biblical decisions. How to trust God. What it looks like to follow Jesus in this broken world. Is that part of your normal, your normal home conversations? Our kids need to hear us talk about these things outside the church environment. Parents, please. Grandparents, please. If, only, if, if all your kids and, grand, and grandkids hear is you talk about Jesus in this context, they will conclude that Jesus is irrelevant out there in the world. And I know you don't want that. So the way that they understand that Jesus is relevant in this, in this world is in your world out there. You're talking about it. It's normal for you to have these conversations going on. You say, well, I, I read the Bible to my kids every night before they go to bed. Awesome. Wonderful. Perfect. Keep it up. Keep doing it. Okay? That's one thing. Now, now have conversations. Have spiritual conversations when you get up, when you go to bed, when you're on the road, when you go on vacation. When, I mean, that, that has a huge impact on your kids. One of the greatest spiritual impacts on my life was, was my grandfather. He's the one that taught me how to hunt. You know, that one side of the family didn't do that. He did. And I idolized this guy. And he was a larger than life personality. And, and he loved Jesus. And Jesus was real to him. And the very first time I'm 12 years old, I, I go deer hunting with him, and I'm just, you know, attached to his hip. We're walking through the woods over in central Oregon together, and he's talking about God. How God, you know, created all this, and isn't he so wonderful letting us enjoy this? And then he looks at me, Dale, let's just, I mean, I'm 12 years old. Dale, let's just stop here on this stump, and let's just pray and thank the Lord for this. I'm like, this is incredible. It's like, he actually knows Jesus. And Jesus goes hunting with us. That's awesome, okay? <laughs> Huge impact. Teaching happens through lifestyle discussions. Last one here, teaching happens through a consistent home environment. It says write them on the doorpost. And it, really all of this talks about environment. Write them these principles, these truths on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. See, it permeates everything. It permeates everything. Environment influences the development of our kids. Please know this. It works, way, works that way in farming and planting. It works this way with raising and training up our kids. The environments of our homes actually teach our kids what's important. It, it, the environments teach our kids what we value. The environment itself. What is your home environment teaching your kids? What is it teaching your kids about stress, about money, about relationships, about love, about honesty, about how to invest time? The environment 
They're drawing conclusions by the environment of your house. Trust me. So one of the things that Lisa and I decided years ago about environment is, and this is just one example, is that we wanted our home to always be a refuge. Okay, we, our home will be a refuge. We, it's not, we're not going to allow it to be chaotic. We're, we're not going to allow massive amounts of drama. We are going to control the environment of our home because out in that world, we get beat up. And we, we even told our kids this. The world's going to beat you up. But when you come home, this will always be your refuge. This will be the place where you can always get put back together. It will always be that place. My kids are adults, and they always know they can come to our house, and it will be a refuge. Because that was just a value that, that we, we tried to live. Teaching happens through just a consistent home environment. So, T, it stands for teaching. And I got four more to go, so buckle up. We're going to go through them pretty fast. What does R stand for? R stands for the word reprove. All right? Reprove. This is where we're going to talk about discipline. The word reprove, it means this, to correct usually gently or with, with kindly intent. Okay, so it doesn't have to be some big negative thing. We're trying to help them grow. The Bible talks about discipline, Proverbs 19. Parents, you got to listen to this verse. Discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. Kind of a big deal. Discipline is kind of a big deal. Proverbs 29, 17, discipline your children and they will give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. That's the result of discipline. So two things about discipline. It's a huge topic. I don't have time really to do it justice, but here, two things. Discipline and how you protect your child's future. The way to protect your child from making decisions that will ruin their lives is to be intentional with discipline today. No parent wants to do anything to hinder the future of their child, but a lack of discipline will, according to the Word of God. So let's believe the Word of God, not culture. It's not an education or a great job that will grant your kids success as adults. It will be your commitment to discipline them so you can intentionally train them to be responsible, godly followers of Jesus as adults. When the Bible says discipline your children while there is hope, I believe there is a window of opportunity in parenting where discipline is so much more hopeful and productive. You say, what is that? It's just generally when they're younger, when they're younger. If you can be just, just vigilant at discipline and consistent with discipline in those first five, six, seven, eight years, I tell you what, the discipline's going to be way easier when they're 16. Yeah. Way easier. But if you wait until teens to start getting serious about discipline, um, that's just not a very hopeful approach. The younger they are produces more hope. And scripture says that. You also discipline, it will empower you to enjoy parenting. And say, what do you mean? Because that's what, that's what it says. That you discipline them and, and they will give you peace of mind and, and make you glad. I know as parents, sometimes we wonder about that, all right? But, but that is the end result of discipline. Parenting is filled with, with frustrations and, and, and challenges under the best of circumstances, yet discipline is how we can actually enjoy the process. Discipline trains our kids to act and live in a way that can actually make you glad. As a parent, I know some of you are in the middle of a hard thing, and so that's hard to even imagine, but that's what it says. The result of effective discipline actually makes you feel good as a parent. Discipline shapes character. Discipline shapes character. Watching character develop in your kids is a rewarding experience as a parent. Seeing the rewards of discipline is enjoyable. And again, I wish I could just go into a bunch of more practical ways to do this because that would be a whole series in and of itself. I want to give you one discipline tip, parents. Okay? Just, just one simple discipline tip. Try not to get emotionally involved in disciplining your kids. You say, well, what do you mean by that? I see so many parents who create as much emotional drama as their kids. Kids get all worked up, that's what kids do. Teens get all worked up, that's what they do, okay? The parents get all worked up. And so then there's yelling and there's screaming and there's outbursts of anger. Okay, can I just say this? Practice disciplining without the emotion. It's more enjoyable. It's just, it's just more enjoyable. I, I tell parents all the time, listen, don't enter the emotional world of your children. Don't go there, don't do it. It's a dark, crazy place, okay? 
And you can never win. If you enter their emotional world, their emotional drama, you will always lose. You know why? Because they have more emotional energy than you do. That's why you're exhausted with it all the time. Don't go there. Let them react. You're like, okay, that's just fine. How do you do that? I'm going to show you how this works. I mean, how it plays out in our own family. But listen, it just you, you, clear, clear consequences and follow through. They know in advance. They just know in advance. Okay, years ago, when, when, you know, before the smartphones came out, this whole, you know, phone thing started, you know, it, it was not a thing. My kids were on the front end of that, okay? And they're in junior high and high school, and the whole flip phones came out, and the texting came out, and we were clueless what was going on until we had a $300 text bill. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We learned fast, too, as parents. We got to have some rules on the phone. So we sat down with our kids, and we said, listen, here are the rules of the phone. One of the rules with the phone used was this. There was a certain amount, of a certain time in the evening where the phones were turned off, okay? You can't use them. You cannot use... I'm not, so calm down. All these teens are going, oh my gosh, my parents are going to tell me to do this. Um, I don't even remember what the time was. But it was an agreed upon time. And if you didn't do it, this was the consequence. They, are, they, they, they just knew it's your choice. All right? You have all this power with the phone in this parameter. If you don't, that phone's mine. Simple, right? We came home one night. It was past the phone curfew. I opened the doors. We came home, Lisa and I. My two daughters were home, and we opened up the hallway, and their bedroom doors were open, and I saw one daughter sitting on her bed, and that's back where they had a flip phone. We walked in the house, and I heard the flip. <laughs> Didn't say one word. And we walked in the house and put our stuff away, and I'm sure she was just sitting in the room just paranoid. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And eventually I walked into her room, of course, and she's sitting on her bed with kind of big eye, guilty look that you get, you know, not one word was spoken. I just went like this. Phone was in my hand. I turned around, walked out. No drama, right? It really can work. It really can. Don't walk into the emotional world of your kids. Oh my goodness. You will enjoy discipline a lot more when you do that. All right, three. Affirm. Affirm. Parents, it is absolutely essential that we learn how to affirm who God made our kids to be. Proverbs 10, 21. I know none of these verses are parenting verses, but let's personalize them as parents and as grandparents. The words of the godly encourage. Fools are destroyed by their lack of common sense. 1 Thessalonians 5. So encourage each other, build each other up. Just as you're doing. First Thessalonians 5.14, brothers and sisters, moms and dads, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. And sometimes our kids are. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. How do we do this as parents? Two things, two ways. Discover the unique qualities of your child. I know it sounds basic, and I realize most parents already see this, but let me encourage you to be even more intentional. Be intentional with this. God's unique design for your kids is a parent's primary responsibility to point out. Not so much for your kids to discover that on their own. You see them better. You see them first. Your kids are going to see what they're not. You see who they are. That is your job as a parent. Discover how God made them. Let go of what you think they should be. Discover who God made them to be. Oh, by the way, while we're doing that, you know, your kids are not going to be good at everything. Therefore, please stop telling them they are. <laughs> Don't lie to your kids. I mean, you can tell them that way when they're two. Don't tell them that way when they're 12. All right? They already know. Your job is to discover what they're good at, what they're designed to do by God. Our kids are going to be obsessed with what they're not good at. They already know. Your job is to be committed to affirm. Look, look how God made you to be. And so that's the next thing here. So you practice that. Practice affirming. Practice affirming their, those unique qualities. Affirm how God made them when they start comparing. Your kids compare. As soon as they start going to school, they are going to start comparing themselves to other kids, other, other people. If they have siblings, they're going to start comparing them to their, 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 their other siblings. I was a younger brother. My, my brother was older than me. I was always comparing myself to him constantly. The older I got, the more intense it got. He was just better at me than certain things. God made him different. He made, God made him different. You know, and 
He's up here on the worship team most Sundays. And I did not get the, the, the deep end of the musical gene pool like he did. He was always better at music, always better at what he could do with instruments that, that I could do. And it used to be, I get so angry. And my mom, bless her heart, the wisdom of a mom who would just get in my grill in a good way. She knew me. I needed to have people in my grill. And she would point her finger and poke my chest because she was only about 5'2", okay? And she says, you know, God didn't make you to be a Jeff. God made you to be a Dale. He made you that way. Stop trying to be somebody God didn't make you to be. Don't let the enemy do that to you. I mean, she would just, you know, go at me. But praise God for that. Because I started believing that, well, I don't have to be like somebody else. Like, it's, okay, it's okay for me to be who God made me to be. Celebrate their uniqueness, even if it's different from you. Because sometimes as parents, we have, we have ideas of what we want our kids to be or we, we, we expected them to be. You know, I, I was in high school, I was uh, junior high, high school, I was very, I, you know, I, I was an athlete, I was, I was a proverbial jock, okay, so I played sports, I was very into sports, it was a very important part of my life. I just assumed my kids would be that way too, right? They're going to get some of that DNA in there, come on, we're going to be, and then my kids started playing sports, you know, and one daughter, daughter in particular, you know, I don't know, first grade, second grade, you know, it's, it's they're playing that peewee basketball, if you can call it basketball, Okay. And basketball was my sport. I'm like, yeah, here we go. And that yeah, first game, here she is dribbling down the court, okay? And she's got blonde hair. She's whipping it back and forth, you know, kind of skipping down. And with a hand on her hip, like this. <laughs> What's going on? Where's that killer drive? Started playing other sports pretty soon. I mean, this girl was amazing with hair from day one almost. I mean, you know, so now she's playing soccer. And during the soccer game, she would change her hairstyle five different times. Okay. But that, she'd come out of her room at eight years old with her hair French braided. How'd you do that? Oh, I did it myself. She, she was just crazy good as a child. What does she do today? She owns her own salon in town. Okay. We, we saw these things early on. Yes, God can design people to do just exactly that. Folks, I'm telling you, affirm that God has a future for them based on their design. Please hear this. This helps them not simply pursue a career to make money. Please don't do that to your kids. What will fulfill your kids is living in a way that God created them, not in a way that just makes money. That's the world's model. God designed them uniquely. Discover it, affirm it, champion it, fan the flame, tell them that that, that I mean, just, Help them move in that direction. That's how they'll be fulfilled. All right, four. Four is inspire. First Corinthians 1, uh, 11 and 1. Paul says, you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. See, we imitate people that inspire us. And so how can we inspire our kids so they imitate us? So just two things. Folks, you get a model of life that inspires and it starts with you being consistent, not perfect, but consistent. Doing the right things over a significant period of time is inspiring. Your kids won't begin to truly think this way until they're older. But it's going to happen. I'm telling you, it'll happen. Your life will be in such stark contrast to most people they know now that they're adults that they will be inspired to imitate you. See, what happens as our kids become adults and they start doing their own life, I always say this, life teaches us humility. It just does. It teaches everyone humility. Now they know how hard life is, how hard married life is, how hard it is to balance that and careers. And now they look at you and they look at you differently. They go back and, and, and now they're inspired by your life. The conversations that we get to have with our kids today are just priceless. They're priceless. I mean, our kids are in their early 30s, and they have kids, and we have grandkids, and, and, and now they come back, and they look at us, and they go, how did you guys do that? I mean, we're at the same season that you guys were, and you were balancing all these things. How did you do that? And, and then we've had these conversations just recently where they said this, if mom and dad, if mom and dad did it, we can do it too. If mom and dad chose to follow Jesus like that, I know it works because it worked for them. We'll choose to do the same thing. Ugh, priceless, priceless. Model of life also that inspires them to follow Jesus. 
Our lives need to model for our kids what it looks like to follow Jesus in this broken world. Does our faith inspire them to do the same? Does our generosity, our service, our biblical values, our, our marriage, or even your singleness, if you're a single parent, oh my goodness, you, you, you are going to inspire them. They're going to look back and go, oh my goodness, I had no idea how hard it was. How did you do it? Our kids are going to know how to follow Jesus, not because we took them to church, but because they watched their parents follow Jesus for 18, 19, 20 some years. This is how you transfer your faith to the next generation. It is inspiration, not explanation. It's inspiration, not just explanation. They see the right things in you and they want it. All right, the last one here is navigate. We have to help them navigate. And the way we help them navigate is by imparting to them wisdom. Our kids need wisdom to navigate life. And that's exactly what the Word of God says. Proverbs 4 is a parent talking to a child. Get wisdom. Develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. A few verses later, I will teach you wisdom. Wisdom's ways and I'll lead you in straight paths. So if our kids are going to be equipped to live in this world, we have to not just give them information. We've got to give them wisdom. So let me just share two things in wrapping this up. So give your kids wisdom, not information. And there's a huge difference between the two. Information is an explanation of the what. Wisdom is the application of the how. If we want our kids to navigate life, they need to know how, folks. They need to know how because wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. It's not knowledge. It's the application. It's the how. It's great. Good information is teaching our kids. You need to love God and love each other. Absolutely. Great information. All right. Wisdom is showing them how to love God and how to love each other. That's wisdom. The younger your kids are, the more information heavy the parenting needs to be. When they're young, it's information heavy. They need a lot of information at that level. You're building foundation. As they get older, they need more wisdom. They need more application of truth. Sometimes parents, I see, I see this with parents. Sometimes they're trying to give information, especially to their older teens, when they really need to be focusing on wisdom. I'm telling you, your kid needs wisdom, not more information. They're not listening to your lecture anyway. Trust me. They've heard it before. Yeah, but they're not doing it. They need wisdom. So let me finish with this. How do you give your older teens wisdom? You're not going to like what I have to say, but you got to do it. Let your kids make mistakes. Let your kids make mistakes. The basic principle of how we learn, folks, we learn through trial and error. We learn through failure. Therefore, please stop trying to keep your kids from making mistakes. It's how they learn wisdom. Remember your job as a parent is to train. It's to train. Your job as a parent is not simply to protect them. Please, please get this. Failure and pain create teachable moments to impart wisdom into the kids like nothing else. Nothing else. If you're constantly trying to keep your kids from pain, you will hinder their training. Training requires practice, failure, pain, frustration. We all know that some of the most painful life lessons we have all learned have, have come from the most painful experiences. So stop trying to remove this privilege from your kids. It's a privilege because they're getting wisdom. I just don't want my kids making my mistakes. They won't, okay? Because they're not you. They're not you. They will not make your mistakes. They will make their own mistakes. And it's okay. Therefore, let me show you how to apply this. Allow your kids to make manageable mistakes. Let your kids make manageable mistakes. What's a manageable mistake? Well, there are some mistakes that as Lisa and I, our kids get older, we knew we needed to let them start applying some of the things that, that we have been instilling into them. And so we would let them make manageable mistakes. We knew what they were choosing was not right. We would let them choose it anyway. Why would you do that? Does God not do the same thing with you? So you think you can parent better than God? Okay, enough said. So we would let them make mistakes that did not alter the course of their life. 
If that, if that mistake was huge, it was big, it would alter the course of their life, we would step in and protect them, even if they didn't understand. Nope, you can't do it. I don't know, get it. I don't care, don't care, don't care, all right? I will not enter your emotional world, but I don't care. No, someday you'll understand. But if that mistake was manageable, it might have been crazy painful, we knew it would create pain. We would let them do it. Why? They're going to test their theory. I want them to test their theory while they're living under my roof, while we have a great relationship with our kids. So when they test their theory and it doesn't work and it's painful, we get to talk about it rather than on a college campus somewhere all by themselves. And now for the first time in their life, they're experiencing freedom. I think I'd rather have it under my roof. Don't you think so, parents? Amen. Amen. Because now we can have conversations. I would, it's never I told you so thing. It's, it's what would you learn? Well, what are we learning? Did it work? Did it not? I'm not here to, to make them feel guilty. I want them to have wisdom. Because that's what training requires. Oh, the opportunities that's created for application. Again, so by the time your kids, folks, I'm telling you, are 16, 17, 18 years old, there's not much more information. They're going to listen to you anyway. It's, it, they're, they're past the information stage. You, you've told them these basics already. They need the school of life. They need to be learning wisdom. And this really is how to train up your kids. Train up your kids. Our job, our job is to train our kids. And it's tough. And it's perplexing. And it's difficult. Out of all the things over the years that that have driven me to depend on Jesus. And there's been a lot. Painful life experiences. Being a pastor, oh my goodness, you know, being overwhelmed with that responsibility. It's driven me to Jesus. But I'm telling you, parenting is at the top of that list. Like, Lord, I can't. Kids, Jesus loves your kids more than you. I know that's hard to even imagine, but he does. He wants to help you with the parenting. He wants to help you with the discipline. He wants to help you with the training. Involve him. Ask him. Let it drive you to him. He'll give you unique perspective with each child because each one's unique. He'll show you their uniqueness. He'll help you. Involve him in that. Because I don't know about you, I cannot be a parent that I need to be, that my kids needed without his help. And now that I'm a grandparent, oh man, what a privilege. But I can't be the grandparent that my grandkids need without his help either. So, can we just pray? And how about we just take a moment and just depend on the Lord for parenting? And just admit that, Lord, without you, we can't do it. We just can't do it. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this incredible privilege of being a parent. And it is a great privilege, but Lord, it's also sometimes so hard. And we feel so desperate and lost sometimes as parents. And sometimes we just, we feel guilty for mistakes we've made. And Lord Jesus, we want to just give all that messiness to you this morning. And we just invite you into our, our parenting, into our families. We invite you into those that are single parents and they're fighting a the battle by themselves. And we're asking you, Lord, to be enough for us. Be enough. 
Help us be the parents that our kids need. Because we cannot, we cannot do this without you. Impossible. Help us train them to be the next generation who follows you in this broken world. Show us how to pass that baton to the next generation who will influence for you. So Lord, we're going to trust you with this. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, we'd love to be able to pray with you. If you just need someone this morning to pray with you, we always have people over here underneath the cross as we sing one last song. We just want you to know you're loved, you're supported. Life's tough. And mothers, we want you to know something. We love you. We love you. Your role is so unique. It is just unlike anything else. And only you can fulfill that role. Thank you for your influence. Thank you for the influence in our lives. You influence way more than you think. So moms, Lord bless you today. Mm -hmm. Tasty groove. Jimmy's gonna jump in it once in a while. There we go. Mm. We thought we'd uh, 
put a taste of groove together for how suave Pastor Dale looked this morning. Right, am I right? We like to have fun here, and I tried to convince Gabe to play the intro to Staying Alive as he walked up, but uh, anyway, it's probably best. God is so good, amen? Mm. The song about God promises. There's so many verses in the Bible about God's promise. I'm going to read a couple this morning for us. This is out of Isaiah 41. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And Philippians 4.19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given us to us in Christ Jesus. Thank you.